evacuation of civilians has profound impacts on the natural environment. This image was taken in 1996, after the Tanzanian government decided to close camps for Rwandan refugees. The column of refugees in this photo stretched for 27 miles toward the Rwandan border. These women are IDPs, internally displaced persons. Although they have fled the genocide in Darfur province, they have not crossed the Sudanese border and are not considered refugees under international law. To collect wood for cooking, they must risk being attacked by the Janjaweed, government-backed Arab militiamen who target the Sudan's black population. With their heavy demand for wood, the Sudan's six million internally displaced persons add further stress to a landscape already degraded by climate change and desertification. Internal displacement is a growing problem in Iraq. An estimated two million civilians have been displaced since the start of Operation Iraqi Freedom. IDP camps have sprung up in the outskirts of Najaf, Baghdad, and Nineveh. Many lack potable water, medicine, and proper waste disposal. The real risk of not addressing the environmental problems is that people simply have to leave their, their homes. If they don't have wood to, to burn, uh, to cook with, to heat their, their homes with, if they don't have water to drink, they leave. And you see massive displacement happening. We call it environmental refugees, if you will. But people are leaving their homes. Uh, this creates a demand on resources. It creates a demand on infrastructure. And ultimately, displacement undermines the peace process. In the Vietnam War, which the Vietnamese call the American War, there is a clash, there was a clash between a very highly technological society and a largely agrarian society. I think we had a lot of arrogance. We thought we were going to go in and take control, blow up what we needed to blow up, and do basically what we wanted. One of the main reasons that I refused to carry a weapon was that I could not see any justification for the destruction of the land at the level that I saw it. An infantry platoon was mainly moved from place to place by helicopter. The helicopters would fly high so as not to draw ground fire. Now when you're at a high altitude, you can look out on the land and see it for miles and miles and miles. And in the Coochie area especially, there were times and places where I would look out and see nothing but a ravaged landscape. Bomb craters, one after the other, so close together. And you'd see little islands of green that had not been bombed. I grew up in a small town in Illinois, uh, a town surrounded by cornfields and bean fields, a very beautiful town along the Illinois River. And when I saw from high in the sky the destruction to the land, I couldn't help wondering, what if that had happened to our cornfields, our bean fields? How would we feel if that happened? at all but when I saw that level of destruction I could not believe that this was going to lead to democracy that this was a line in the sand that was going to be for the cause of freedom I lost whatever little faith I had in the war being noble in any sense
Far away in the Pacific lies the tiny atoll of Bikini in the Marshall Islands, chosen spot for the unleashing of mankind's most terrible force. The lagoon will be the graveyard of many ships, a ghostly navy manned only by goats, pigs and white rats awaiting the atomic blast. Army and Navy personnel come ashore to carry out their first task to deal with the islanders who lived under Japanese mandate for 20 years. Now then, James, tell them, please, that uh, the United States government now wants to turn this great destructive power into something for the benefit of mankind. And that these experiments here at Bikini are the first step in that direction. I think it's generally the case that the greater and more durable impacts come from preparation for war rather than combat itself. Thus have defense lines formed to support the men who march and sail and fly. But the mobilization reaches still further into the life of the nation. Axes must swing in the forests and trees must fall. For the sawmills wait for logs and builders wait for lumber. States feel the need to be militarily prepared, and in the modern world that has meant building a military-industrial complex, building a pollution-intensive industry to generate military goods. One of the best examples of how the business of preparing for war can have long-lasting environmental impacts is the nuclear weapons programs around the world that have been in place since the early 1940s. Wherever this has happened, there have been environmental problems with radioactive waste, which no one anywhere has satisfactorily solved. I grew up near the Hanford Nuclear Reservation, which is located in Washington State. When the nuclear bombs were developed there, little thought was given to what to do about the waste that would result afterwards. Indeed, now the U.S. Department of Energy calls Hanford the world's largest environmental cleanup project. Hanford, Washington is the site where the United States has essentially accumulated its nuclear waste, mostly from weapons work, also from nuclear power and other radioactive related uh, industries. Hanford was constructed in 1942 under the top-secret Manhattan Project. Its location along the Columbia River provided a ready source of water for cooling nuclear reactors. The Hanford Engineering Works produced the plutonium used in the Trinity test device and in the Fat Man bomb released on Nagasaki. Production of plutonium intensified during the Cold War. In 1963, the dual-purpose N reactor was constructed to generate nuclear power for civilian use. With the reactor building completed in 1963, the late President John F. Kennedy arrived at Hanford to break ground for the construction of the power plant. And I think it's very appropriate that we come here, where so much has been done to build the military strength of the United States, and to find a chance to strike a blow for peace, and to find a chance to strike a blow for a better life for our fellow citizens. This is a great national asset here. I can assure you it will be maintained. And from the work we begin today, I hope the light will spread out, not merely to those who are served by electricity, but to all the world to realize that here in the United States, we're moving ahead and providing security for our people and also a hope for a better life in this most beautiful country of ours. Thank you. Since the production of plutonium ceased in 1987, cleanup has been the only mission at the Hanford Nuclear Reservation. There are 53 million gallons of high-level radioactive and chemical waste at Hanford, stored in 177 underground tanks. 70 of these tanks have leaked, spilling approximately 1 million gallons of waste into the soil. Hanford, Washington is a wasteland of leaking radioactive waste that will be with us for decades and decades, probably centuries to come, and is currently costing us billions of dollars to just try to contain, let alone clean up. In truth, it's never going to be cleaned up. And some of the radioactive wastes 
will remain potentially lethal for 24,000 years, which is, anyway, you slice it, a long time. The United States used to stockpile chemical weapons, unbeknownst to most of the world, in Germany and in Okinawa with U.S. troops in Japan. And those two stockpiles, which were never used, of course, were shipped back secretly to Johnston Atoll in the Pacific. And one of the world's largest incinerators was built in the middle of a wildlife refuge. And that process in burning those chemical weapons from Okinawa in Germany took place from 1990 to, to the year 2000. Johnston Atoll has been, it still is being studied, uh, but that's actually a very interesting case of a unique coral reef, really, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. It's about 750 miles west of Hawaii that was used as a launch site for atmospheric nuclear testing. On 25 July, the Thor vehicle for Bluegill Prime had a one-of-a-kind casualty, diagnosed as a sticking fuel valve, which caused a fire at motor ignition. Both missile and warhead burned on the launching pad. When at least one of the atmospheric tests with a hydrogen bomb blew up on the launch pad, a good part of Johnson Atoll was left with highly radioactive plutonium debris. Twenty years later, all the Agent Orange, uh, that was all dumped on Johnson, uh, stored, as they say, on Johnson Atoll. It really, over time, became a dump site of Agent Orange. And now, thirdly, we put chemical weapons on Johnson Atoll. This National Wildlife Refuge under the Fish and Wildlife Department has really been used and abused by the military over the ages. Only a few hours before it was wiped out, Hiroshima was efficiently preparing for an air raid. It had had raids before, knew what to do. In surface shelters, the people calmly waited all unaware that already descending upon them was the atom bomb. When it was all over, four and a half square miles of Hiroshima was burned and blasted to extinction. The all-shattering devastation in which was born the atomic age. Radiation effects were fantastically imprinted on walls and furniture like frozen shadows, a ladder outlined on a building. The design of her dress left on the body of a woman who would die in a few days anyhow, not from her burns or visible wounds, but from radioactivity, the killer that invisibly turns the blood into lifeless water. Members of the so-called nuclear club, states known to have detonated nuclear weapons either on domestic or foreign soil. Among them, at least 2,000 tests have been conducted in the atmosphere, underwater, underground, and in space. We're retaining tens of thousands of nuclear weapons when probably a few hundred would uh, be enough for deterrence. We have nuclear weapons far in excess of any conceivable need for them as the strongest conventional power by orders of magnitude in the world for this country to say that we need nuclear weapons, what does that signal to the rest of the world? That they must be very valuable and that they probably would want to get them themselves. We know that as long as any nation retains nuclear weapons, other nations will want them. A few years ago, there was a real promise of hope for the poor, both black and white, through the poverty program. Then came the build-up in Vietnam. And I watched this program broken and eviscerated as if it was some idle political plaything of a society gone mad on war. And I knew that America would never invest the necessary funds or energies in rehabilitation of its poor.
So long as adventures like Vietnam continue to draw men and skills and money, like some demonic destructive suction tube. The world is currently spending somewhere around a trillion US dollars on war and preparations for war, and this is an enormous diversion. For a fraction of that amount, we could have clean water, sanitation, education, good health care uh, for everybody on the planet. So it's a terrible diversion of resources. Any war that takes place, uh, no matter how large or how small, has enormous costs uh, to it. We're talking in Lebanon today, billions of dollars of cleaning up just a 15-day war, let alone, you know, the years and years of warfare in Iraq or Afghanistan or Vietnam or wherever else they may take place. So the costs of war really, uh, if they're well understood, and in most cases they're not, but if they're well understood, should preclude uh, the war to begin with. The war is not worth the cost in terms of lives, but also long-term environmental and public health damage for decades to come. Fossil fuel is a particular problem in this time of concern about climate change. Just one example I think illustrates it well. If we imagine one F-16 fighter jet flying for just under one hour, it uses approximately twice as much oil as the average American citizen uses in his or her car every year. The F-16 is just one machine in one branch of the military. To take another example, the Army's Abrams tank weighs 68 tons and requires two gallons of fuel per mile. All told, the United States Department of Defense burns some 350,000 barrels of oil per day, making it the world's largest single consumer. The Defense Department uses, I think, somewhat over two-thirds of the energy of the, that the U.S. government um, uses. Um, and it uses them for ships and tanks and planes and heating buildings and a whole host of other things. But probably the largest impact that all the defense effort has is a diversion of intellectual energy and our monetary resources away from trying to solve and address some of the long-term problems. Sea level is also rising. And in Louisiana, we've been losing 30 square miles a year, roughly, uh, of land. I mean, if the United States were losing that to some foreign power, we'd have the military out there defending it. We often ask the question, where were you on September 11th? Well, I remember that very clearly because I was in New York, and I was there specifically to give a luncheon address at the New York Times on the new book, um, Eco-Economy, Building an Economy for the Earth. Well, by mid-morning, that lunch was already history. Terrorism is a threat, no question about it. But on my list of threats to our future, um, there, there are many more serious threats. Climate change being an obvious one. Population growth being another. The economy does not exist in the vacuum. It is entirely dependent on the Earth's natural systems and resources. And if we damage and destroy those systems and resources, then the economy will eventually decline and one day collapse. The challenge is not to fashion a high-tech military response to terrorism. That won't work. The challenge is to build an environmentally sustainable, equitable society that will do more to undermine terrorism than any possible high-tech military weapon systems we can devise. The other exciting thing is that almost everything we need to do has already been done by at least one country. 